I want to thank everybody in the room. I want to thank everybody on the call for joining us. Uh, every good story starts with a little bit of mystery. This is the box of corneas coming into Kanat Hospital in Sierra Leone, where we started the first organ transplants. Dr. Mustafa is sitting at my right, and I started the first organ transplants in the country of Sierra Leone together. And I just wanted to open with the story of our first patient who received the organ transplant. This yeah. is uh, Balo Sete. You can see the, the uh, left eye has a cornea transplant in it. You can see that the right eye is basically missing. Ms. Sete was completely blind for 29 years from when she was a young teenager until her 40s when she received the transplant. She had never seen her children before in her life. She had five kids. The uh, woman next to her is her daughter, who she saw for the first time at age 19. Uh, so, you know, it, she walked out. Her daughter started crying because she had never seen her mother walking on her own. And she turned and said, girl, why are you crying? Because she had no idea who it was until she spoke and recognized the voice. Wow. So we're going to talk with three really uh, distinguished panelists, and I'll introduce first Dr. Vidya Pond. Uh, Vidya taught me manual small incision cataract surgery, also known as M6, in Nepal uh, a few years ago, where I actually got COVID for the first time in the <laughs> beginning of 2020, the slaughter of China. So uh, welcome, Vidya. Hello. Hi. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I will just uh, introduce my experience in Myanmar since 2014 to till date. Please, next slide. Yeah, yeah little, very short in Myanmar, it is, the country is located in the Southeast Asia, and this is one of the poorest country in the world. And the GDP of, of this country is going down after this COVID and uh, the poop, uh, the medical indicators are very low there. And uh, urban population is about 30% and uh, rural population is more in this country. And uh, politically, this is very disturbed country. And uh, these days there is military is ruling in this country. Please, next slide. Yeah, the current situation, of the eye care situation, eye care in the country is uh, there is no actual data for the blindness, and there is only one rap survey was done in 2019, but the result is not published yet. And one study was done there in 2005 by Australian doctors in Mithila district, and where they found out 8.1 blind uh, in above 40 years of age. That is very quite high. There is about 350 ophthalmologists in the country, but nowadays several are out of the country and most of them, they are situated in the big cities. And there are four places in the residency program and very limited subspecialty service in the country, no national eye care team and no coordination between the service provider, no national plan for eye care and the resource is not uh, adequately di distributed in the country. No optometrist training center, no optometrist training program in the country, no ophthalmic assistant training program. I care service is delivering by government level and from monastery and from army hospital and the private sectors. But in the rural area, most of the monastery eye hospital are giving more cataract surgeries. And C CSR is maybe approximately 1500. I'm not quite sure. Before COVID, there were several NGOs was working in the country, but after COVID, we are very few in the country now. Yeah, since 2014, August, I'm working there. And after that time, my team could establish five eye hospitals in the country, in the different part of the place. And we performed nearly 200,000 eye surgeries in those five, five hospitals, and all surgeries are free of cost. And yearly, our yearly performance was 
from 25,000 to 35 surgery in that country. Most of the doctors I was bringing from Nepal, an ophthalmic assistant, I'm an optometrist. But now we have already trained a uh, few Myanmar doctors with our sponsorship, three, we, they finished residency in Bangkok and three in Nepal. As well, so some of the uh, paramedical staff also we trained in Nepal and in Arvind. And now and we train two fellowship training program, one in Arvind and one in LV Prasad in Cornea. And now one uh, doctor is getting fellowship in Bangladesh. She recently joined there. And another one will soon to soon go to LV Prasad. So these are some photo of the yeah. yes yes yeah. This is the first eye hospital. The first picture where I first time go in that hospital that is Tipitaka Sakupala Eye Hospital in Tisang. It is in the rural area of the Myanmar. But uh, then. We build more and more, more and more people are coming to for surgery than to accommodate them. We are gradually building. And now at the moment, the hospital building is very big complex is there. And the person sitting here, he is the one of the prominent monk in Myanmar. He is our partner in Myanmar and he is taking care of all logistic things. And this hospital became one of the highest volume surgical center in Southeast Asia. And we was doing nearly 27,000 surgery in this hospital. But after COOP and after this COVID, it is a little bit disturbance and the political situation in that area is not very good. Another slide, please. Yeah, this is another hospital uh, located in the mountain area of the Myanmar and uh, the place name called Taoji. And it's very nice building there and uh, well equipped hospital and it was support initially supported by Seva Foundation and then some of my friends from Denmark they helped Mimi to equip this hospital and now BBSI Foundation from USA is helping and Adak Foundation is helping me to do the pre surgery in this hospital. Another please. Next slide. Yeah. This hospital is located in the south east of the Wakema. And we started doing surgery in small building. And currently we have another big building and with nice operation rooms there. And this crowd is one of the OPD day. And this hospital is not running around the year. Some Whenever I go there, I do surgery and I stay there about 10 days and do about 100 surgery, sorry, 1,000 surgery there and then go to the another place. So permanently, every day this hospital is not running. Only when I'm visiting there, it is working. Next slide, please. And this is another hospital also in the mountain area. It's not very densely populated area, so it is not a high volume surgical center, but we are working in this hospital also. Next, please. Yeah, this is this another hospital. It's located in the center of the Myanmar in between Nipiro and Yangon, and very easy for the patient to come in that area. This is also uh, built by one of the prominent monks in this uh, of that country. And uh, since last year, after COVID, we started to work in this hospital. And we do quite high volume surgery in this hospital. Next. Yeah, this is our plan. So we are building one more hospital in Yangon, and which will be inaugurated on. 3rd November 2023, so just after one month. So next week I am going to Myanmar and in the same time we will do integrate in this hospital. And we have planned to make this hospital as a referral center where we will start the all kind of subspecialty service. And we will continue our free eye surgery program as long as we have donor who is supporting us for the surgeries. And uh, we will, we will, try to establish one ophthalmic assistant training center in the country from as the experience from Nepal, ophthalmic assistants are doing very vital role to take care of the uh, eye care service in the country. So we planned it before COVID also, but because of COVID, we all, my all team returned to ne Nepal and we could not do it. So we will provide 
training for more fellowship program training. So we need more subspecialty doctor to run this hospital. This is our near future plan. And thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. So I don't want you guys to miss in all of that. Uh, in since 2014, we built six massive eye hospitals and done 200,000 cataract surgeries in Myanmar. For each individual that you do cataract surgery on, you're talking an economic change for an entire family. So that's at least a, about a million people have been impacted by that work, uh, which is massive. Um, so the next person I'd like to introduce is Dr. Mustafa uh, sitting at my right here. She is responsible for the cornea transplant program in Sierra Leone. And she is now the new Deputy Minister of Health of Sierra Leone as well. Uh, so welcome her. And uh, she's going to talk a little bit about what's happening in Sierra Leone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so Sierra Leone is a small country in West Africa, about 8 million people. We have four ophthalmologists in the whole country, so that's one of the largest in Our uh, most recent blindness survey in 2021 showed a high prevalence of blindness in people over 50 at 6%, and most of the causes are cataract, glaucoma, and cognitive disease. The table is just showing you that we do not have the skilled eye personnel to match the those numbers. So, um, some of the challenges we have in the eye health system, um, I mean, they're not unique to Sierra Leone, but um, human resource problems. Uh, inadequate cataract surgical services, <laughs> the advanced eye health services, poor infrastructure, um, limited interest in ophthalmology training among new or graduates, new doctors, and also coordinating all the activities around eye health government, partners, donors, NGOs, coordinating the activities so that they are efficient mm -hmm. in terms of eye health. This picture is showing you what most of the areas look like in terms of access for the patients to get to. So what we've done is um, to try and tackle some of those challenges is firstly establish a mobile eye health outreach program, taking the services to the people. Because we have four ophthalmologists and ophthalmic nurses, but most of them are practicing in the field, which leaves the rest of the population without access. So we're taking these services to the people, um, to establish regular mobile outreach camps, and we screen over forty thousand patients with over one thousand eleven methods in the last two years. Or so. We're also targeting um, the human resource gap through training, um, mostly the primary health workers who are the ones who are delivering care in the in the rural areas. The last two years, we've trained 1,500 primary health workers on living basic eye health care. And at the same time, we're actively targeting new medical doctors, even when they're medical students, to get them interested in ophthalmology. So we keep pursuing you a couple of our new doctors who are working with us when we all outreach and in the hospitals so that we develop our business. And we're happy to say that um, in the last Five years, we've trained maybe three new ophthalmologists, whereas now we have four in training and we have seven who are going for training in the next year. So that's a big difference. How are we doing all of this? So the government is doing its bit, but like any government in a small country that's struggling, we have many competing um, interests in healthcare and limited resources. So we recognize early that we need to um, leverage partnerships we have traditional partners who've been working in the eye health space for decades in Sierra Leone, like Sight Savers and Vision Action. But we also recognize that we need to develop new partnerships in order to achieve what we wanted to achieve in the shortest possible time. So we've been very lucky to have people like Duke University, through Dr. Williams here, <laughs> and um, University of Nebraska, HCP, Dr. Um, Jeff Kevin, 
specific instrumental in helping us to perform in terms of financial or human resources as well, teaching, and you know, they helped us achieve a lot. Some of these things include our flagship Korean program in the Jam of Williams and I. That's happened in Sierra Leone a couple of years ago. Um, during Konya Trans, like you mentioned, the first program transplant in the whole country. Um, in fact, the first organ transplant in the whole country, not just Sierra Leone, but only by countries as well. Um, we've done more than 50 so far successfully. Um, the amount of transformational change you see in the life of the patient is nothing compared to it. And this has um, uh, earned us a lot of global recognition, but also local recognition, which is moving eye health in Sierra Leone into a very good space. Um, uh, other, through the Cornell program, we've been able to achieve other um, advanced specialist eye health care through partners um, like retinal surgery, which is also for the first time now being done in Sierra Leone and in the whole South region. Um, advanced glaucoma surgery as well through um, with many of these partners. And um, this is giving us the space to provide care for the people of Sierra Leone, but also is actually helping us guide interest in ophthalmology training among the young doctors, as well as earning us a lot of support from the government and the Ministry of Health. Some of the um, recognition that we've achieved because of this work is you know, an important um, awards from IAPD, which is like the biggest eye health NGO organization in the world. Um, from the last, the late Queen of England, from our own president, ambassadors. <clears throat> so it's really helping us put more eye health into the space that we want it to be. Thank you for that. Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, um, which is pretty exciting. But again, I want to point out, you know, they screened in two years, 40,000 patients with 1,500 surgeries and have trained hundreds and hundreds of new eye care professionals um, and, and people to reach out into directly into communities. So it's making a massive difference. Uh, then we have one other panelist, Dr. Jeff Taven. Uh, Jeff Taven is famous for many things, uh, such as being in the U.S. Tennis Hall of Fame, being the first person to climb the north face of Everest, uh, being one of the first people to ever bungee jump, um, and uh, also survived training me. Um, I tried to get him fired when I broke my leg climbing one time, and uh, he was self-responsible for that. So uh, without further ado, Jeff Haben is going to give a bit of a, a sort of global overview as he's been in, he's the founder of Himalayan Cataract Project, uh, which provides eye care services around the world. Well, thanks so much, Lloyd. And, and it's such an honor to be here. And, you know, both Vidya Pant and uh, Jalika Masafa are, they're, they're really the global heroes of, of the fight against world blindness. And to me, it's just a travesty that there's not more emphasis on blindness. It really is the lowest hanging fruit in global public health, okay? And as I have no financial personal disclosures on this, but this is what a cataract looks like in the developing world. You know, at Duke, you may occasionally see a cataract like this. This is a person who would have been totally blind, only able to see light and dark. And after surgery, they get perfect sight. And it's crazy. Dr. Pont is one of the few people in the world who's actually personally restored sight to more than 100,000 people with eyes that look like this, who are totally blind. But the travesty is we still have 36 million people on our planet, 90% of them in low resource countries who are completely blind. And half of those, about 16 to 18 million, could have perfect sight restored with a surgery that we can deliver for under $100. The World Health Organization estimates that to overcome all needless blindness on our planet, and 85% of this 36 million people who are blind either could have been prevented or could be treated, 
to restore sight to every single one of them, plus give spectacles to every person whose vision is impaired because they just need glasses, which is 371 million people. The total cost would be about $15 billion, which is way less than our military monthly budget. And when you look at what are the causes of decreased vision in high income countries like the United States, it's you know age related macular degeneration. We have a worldwide epidemic of people uh, getting fatter and having more diabetes and glaucoma. But worldwide, it's cataracts and uncorrected refractive error. And as you heard from Dr. Williams doing the first uh, corneal transplant in Sierra Leone, corneal opacities. And when you look at the impact on world economy, eye conditions are the sixth leading cause of loss of productivity, way ahead of diarrhea, uh, malaria, TB, and it costs the world economy $4,300 billion a year. $4,300 billion a year. And for $15 billion, we could restore sight to every person who's needlessly blind. When you look at quality adjusted life years, there's no intervention in global medicine that even approaches the efficacy of what we do in either preventing blindness, uh, things like vitamin A distribution, preventing people from getting corneal ulcers, or the most absolutely impactful intervention is cataract surgery and um, for quality adjusted life years. And the impact of blindness goes far beyond the individual. The individual suffers, but this is a child who will never go to school because they have to care for their blind father who's blind from river blindness. This is a picture from South Sudan. And the impact on the individual and the family is just really profound. And when we're trying to get places like the Gates Foundation to really up their support of eye care, they say, well, it's not a fatal disease, but it is. When you go blind in a developing country, your life expectancy is one third that of agent health match peers. And for blind children, the fate is much worse. Plus there's the impact on the whole family and blindness really perpetuates poverty. But similarly, poverty really accentuates the suffering of blindness. As you heard, the leading cause of blindness, you know, in low vision, refractive error, cataract, glaucoma is preventable, trachoma is preventable, river blindness is preventable, vitamin A deficiency is preventable, even a lot of the diabetic changes are preventable. Now, the only large poor country to reverse its rate of blindness is Nepal. And Dr. Pont is... So an unbelievable hero. As I said, he's personally done more than 100,000 cataract surgeries, but he's also been involved in kind of the, something that's been called compassionate capitalism. So this is really a sustaining way of doing eye care. By doing very high volume surgery, Dr. Pont can bring the cost down so that even the very poor will pay one month's salary to... Uh, have their cataract surgery. So someone making a subsistence farmer making $2 a day, if they pay $60, Dr. Pont's able to deliver cataract surgery at under $60. So by doing very high volume surgery, the paying patients support that of the free care. Plus they've created an economic model where ophthalmologists do well in Nepal. And so the best young doctors wanna go into ophthalmology and it sort of spirals upwards. Now, we still have huge, huge places in the world where there's a big problem. India and China have lots and lots of blindness. And for the wealthy, they've got great care, but it's a problem of how to get it to the poor. And Africa, as you heard from uh, Dr. Mustafa, is really a place where there's a lack of human resources, as well as the financial resources to take care of blindness. And what Jalika is doing, and she's really one of the greatest heroes on the African planet, and she's really marshalling the whole government and creating a system to maximize what they have there. But I just can't overestimate or oversell uh, how joyous it is. You take someone who's been totally blind, hasn't seen their family, 
and you do their cataract surgery, and it's the same as being at Duke. It's a person who's totally blind, but the next day his vision is perfect. And I'm going to end with a 55 second video, and then I think we're moving. I've been doing this for 30 years, and I still get such joy post op day one. Cats just come off. So blindness really is the lowest hanging fruit. And it's something and something that actually Dr. Williams said when he was first with me in South Sudan was one of the exciting things about global eye care is that when you do the cataract surgery, unlike caring for someone with HIV or a chronic disease or malaria, diabetes, once you do the cataract surgery, they're cured for life. So even though the statistics are very daunting that we have you know, 18 million people blind from cataracts, every surgery that Dr. Mustafa does or Dr. Pont does, they are 100% cured. And there's almost no other fix like that in global public health. And um, it really is a, a very exciting field and in so many ways. And uh, my my. Hope is that in Dr. Mustafa's lifetime, there will be no more needless blindness in Sierra Leone. Thank you, Jeff. Um, yeah, I can go ahead. And... I can attest that, you know, just last December, I was at a cataract camp where we did a thousand cataract surgeries in a week in South Sudan, and I brought a photographer with me who had never seen it. And in the morning, we take 100 bandages off. And he spent the entire morning just crying with each patient one at a time. It's really quite amazing to watch somebody go from darkness for a decade or more to, to coming into the light. Um, Dr. Vidya, what do you, you've clearly made a massive impact in Myanmar. Um, how do we take what's been done in Nepal and Myanmar and carry it into other countries like like Sierra Leone and South Sudan and Liberia and places like that. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I started my international work with Uganda. That was in 2007. First time I visited to Uganda, I saw that there is very bad quality of surgery. They were, they were doing ECC at that time and some of them, they were not putting the IOL, they were giving the Biopic, sorry, a fake glass after surgery. Then I thought that the technique they are using for cataract surgery is not the appropriate. Then I decided to bring some of the Ugandan doctor to Nepal. To my at that time, I was working in Geta Hospital in Nepal, in Western Nepal. That was also a very high volume surgical center. I brought them to my hospital. At that time, there was 30 eye surgeons in Uganda, and out of them, 11 I brought to Dangadi. <laughs> 11 of them I brought to Nepal, and I trained them. Uh, then three more times I visited Uganda, and uh, do I camp together with them, and I supervise their surgery. And after that, I have seen the result that they, after training, when they go back, they were doing very good. Uh, surgery and the result was very good and they were not using biometry before for putting the IOL after that they were using biometry and putting the appropriate then encourage this encourage me to work uh, outside the Nepal as well but I at that time I was very busy in Geta I hospital I, we were very few surgeons in Geta and I could not do more but after 2013 first time I came to Myanmar 
and I have seen, I came, I went there just for one month to Yang, one of the eye hospital in Yangon, monastery eye hospital in Yangon. And I saw that similar problem like Uganda in Myanmar also, blindness is very high and people are getting dead uh, for surgery and even after six months, they were not get operated and they, there is phacomorphic glaucoma and they were being blind. Then I thought that the situation is very bad here. If the capital city has such situation, what will be in outside the capital? Then I decided to do some work there. Then I was finding the hospital. Then luckily I found out that uh, I got relation with that monk and uh, he said that he has a hospital in Tishang village out of the city. Then I went there and see the hospital. Then I got the donor from Australia who is willing to help me for uh, free surgery. They are, that is dark foundation, that is private foundation, Dave and Kerry. And then we decided to work together there. First in uh, Tisang, the eye hospital in Tisang. And the first year, our target was 4,000 surgery, but I did all those 4,000 in three months. Then I asked our donor again, then what we should do? Your need is very high. Then he asked me, how, many, how much you can do in one year? I said, we can do 15,000 surgery here. Then actually we did 18,000 surgery and he paid for all the surgery, all surgery was free. And that hospital became very famous in the country. And then we thought that not only one place is enough. Uh, we could not do the training program there because the local surgeons are not very much interested to get training with us. Uh, so very few, they come here and they, they are still doing ECC. Very few are doing it. SICS and FECO, but most of surgeons in Myanmar are still doing this. They are putting suture, but they don't want to learn M6 and they don't want to learn any other technique. They are satisfied with that. Then we thought that we, we need to bring some, we need to establish some more hospital and with the help of that monk and we got connected with another monk in that area and then Gradually, we built more hospital, more like and a total of now five hospitals are running and one hospital will be inaugurated soon. So besides so, Myanmar, I work with Orbis International also. So. Uh, and explain some things. So he's he's talking, because not everybody here is an eye surgeon. Uh, this <laughs> process called M6 was actually invented by Jeff Tabin and Sandak Rui. And it's a way of doing cataract surgery using um, minimal equipment and minimal expense. Uh, so you don't need a lot of electronic equipment other than the microscope. And in the hands of somebody like Dr. Pont, it's a surgery that can be done in less than three minutes. I, I mean, like, I just can't explain how fast he is at, at this. And um, the impact of M6 and the development that, that Dr. Tabern and Dr. Ruit made has been uh, massive in terms of, of teaching. So Jeff, uh, do you wanna comment a little bit on, you know, Bidio is saying that the main advances that he was able to do in Myanmar were through A, teaching and better techniques and B, um, donors. Do you wanna comment a little bit on how that applies outside of Myanmar around the rest of the world? I think he has a, I think, uh, Dr. Pont's example of what he did in Uganda is, to me, the most important thing. You know, he was really training and empowering the local Ugandans to really pick it up, and he had the enthusiasm, and he had the uh, the vision to bring the Ugandan doctors to see how things could be done in a low resource setting well, and then they came back to their country. Myanmar, it's difficult because of both the political situation and, you know, as he was talking about, uh, you know, the local doctors not being as excited about uh, learning the latest techniques. I think to really change things, you have to incentivize. I mean, doctors need to be paid well. The nurses need to be paid well. And we need to create sustaining systems. And what we really need to strive for is the ability of people to come and seek care before they go blind. 
before they become a burden to society, before they become a burden to their family. And the only way to do that is through quality. And what Dr. Pont does so incredibly well is provide amazing quality surgery. And it was really the quality that drove the demand in Nepal. And they were Dr. Ruit and was my principal partner, but also Dr. Pont had created this system, and I mentioned of you know compassionate capitalism, where paying patients subsidize the poor and doctors still make a very good living. And I think that's what we need to strive for around the world. And you really pushing for real quality. And he was using kind of a lot of big terms of, you know, MSICS, ECCE with sutures. But the basic, the basic concept is we need to provide, and he talked about, you know, the lens implants. We remove the cloudy cataract and replace it with a lens implant that gives good vision. And he talked about the transition to then, you know, measuring each individual patient so you can customize the lens implant you use so that we give great vision to every single individual. And that really, you know, the, the cataract is really the financial cornerstone of building a successful, sustaining eye care program. And it really is the lowest hanging fruit in the lowest hanging trees of global medicine. You know, you have the cataract surgery and, and glasses, and even the poorest of the poor will pay a little bit for spectacles that will allow their child to thrive in school or a pair of reading glasses that will allow them to continue working. So you have all of these little things that can really drive the finances, but you need to really develop as Dr. Mustafa is doing so unbelievably well in Sierra Leone, an overall eye care system and really a, a whole system of being able to diagnose, treat, and at least explain why people have vision loss. And uh, I'm just so excited. I'll, I'll stop and let Dr. Mustafa talk. But really, it's it's a matter of really creating a system with really high quality eye services at all levels. But the financial driver and the really dramatic wow factor are the cataracts. Uh, do you want to comment then on what's really helped you in making an impact in Sierra Leone and what you think maybe remains to be remains to be done? I think um, only one of the things that helped me the most when I went back to Sierra Leone was my team. So, um, I mean, when I went back home, I was the youngest and only female at that level in leadership and healthcare. But um, the people I met there had been working for 10, 15 years in my health. And they embraced me, they looked beyond that, and we really back together. They had been, they had, they were used to doing things a certain way, but they became flexible to change to new ideas, and they supported everything we um, <coughs> put together, and we worked together to achieve what we're doing now. So I don't think um, I would have been able to do anything if I would work without this thing. So it's very important to have like-minded people who are willing to work with you to get where you want to go. The other thing I would say would help now is like Jeff mentioned, um, resources in terms of human resource and the financial resource that we need to get things moving. Um, we have a lot of activities going on in I health space in Sierra Leone so many people and so many there are so many players in the game but it's difficult to coordinate everyone to um you know work together more efficiently so if we could coordinate all these efforts by all the players in i would say not only Sierra Leone but global health all the partners who are working in Sierra Leone for example or maybe somebody's working in Liberia which is just neighboring Sierra Leone who could work together and have more impact in these two countries so if we could be able to coordinate all those efforts link them with the minister's efforts and, you know, just use them more efficiently, I think we could be able to achieve a lot. How do you think your new platform as a deputy minister of health and not just head of the national eye program will enable 
sort of an incorporation of eye care into the whole system of health. How do you think that's going to impact eye health and actually overall medical health in the com in the country? So, um, first of all, I'll say I'm not going to forget that it is my work in eye health that um you know made me lucky enough to be promoted to deputy minister, and I'm very happy about that because it gives me the space to elevate eye health in terms of you know priorities in the Ministry of Health and in the in the government of Sierra as well. But um, more importantly, now because I'm deputy minister of health, my um area of focus goes beyond eye health. Um, everything, including maternal health or even malaria and diarrhea, as Jeff was mentioning. So what we're, as a ministry, what we're trying to focus on is integrating not just eye health, but all other areas into a strong health system that focuses on delivering um, health care, that's quality health care, that's affordable, to every Sierra Leonean across all life stages. So whether they're pregnant women, babies, teenagers, adults, or elderly people, they get the care that they need at any time that they need it without suffering from due financial hardship. So um, I think, mm -hmm. you know, bringing together for everybody, all the sectors that people are working in different sectors, mm -hmm. all the partners who are supporting all these different sectors, um, and that's important, like what Jeff mentioned. Initially, we have Gates Foundation or Global Fund, for example, who are funding uh, child health and vaccination in child health. Sometimes they have lots of resources that are left over or even wasted. But then Eye Health, for example, does not have enough resources. So you would give a child vaccine against uh, measles or uh, pneumonia only for them to be blind from a cataract because you can't solve the problem and you've not helped the child. So we're thinking of how to bring together everyone together so that we can um, be able to provide the care for people yeah. whatever they need, whenever they need. At any point they enter the health system, they should get the care that they need for anything that they'll stay. That's all. Sounds awesome. And Jeff, you also are in a position now where you're not just not just involved in eye care alone, but you're director of global health at Stanford. So how do you see two from your from your side of things? How do you see the house of medicine as a whole interacting with eye care and vice versa? Is there a way that we can we can work together better? But yeah, as, as uh, Professor Mustafa said, I mean, it really needs to be integrated. You know, when you're screening for, uh, in, you know, in rural health clinics, we just need to have eye care as part of the basic screening. We're actually, we're, we're actually working in Northern California. We have, unfortunately, a significant problem in Northern California are unhoused indigent and immigrant and uh, you know, the people working, the population working in, uh, you know, providing food for our tables in the fertile valleys of uh, just a little bit east of us, they don't get eye care. And just integrating screening for eye disease as part of general health screening and creating an access to eye care services. But similarly, you know, diabetes is a huge problem. I mean, I know in North Carolina, you have uh, the barbecues a little bit too good down there. And, uh, you know, you, you have a lot of diabetes in North Carolina. And a lot of the first symptoms that people have in early diabetes is blurred vision uh, as you're Medical students will remember uh, aldose reductase breaks the sugar down into sorbitol, which causes swelling of the lens of the eye and uh, blurred vision is blood sugars um, uh, shift. And often you can pick up early diabetes at a very early stage from people noticing that their vision is becoming blurry. And we need to be able to integrate that so that that can be referred back to the endocrinologist and internists to manage the blood sugar. So it really, it's part of human health. 
And as I you know, mentioned at the start of my talk, it's the lowest hanging fruit in public health and that it's something that we can really fix. And so how to get it into the mainstream so we realize it's part of and in, integral to the health and certainly the well-being of every human. Yeah, absolutely. And that was one of the purposes of not having this talk at the Eye Center, but instead at the Duke Global Health Center was to invite all of you to partner with us in um, in providing Eye Center and also to hopefully get you to invite us to partner with you in the care that you're doing so that we can integrate both the eye and medical care together. Um, we're sort of starting to run down towards the end, but what I'd like to ask you, uh, Dr. Pont, is um, what do you think is the, the number one thing that our listeners could do to uh, help improve eye care in the world or in Myanmar and Nepal? And we see in developing country, as Dr. Jeff Kevin told us that cataract is a still leading cause of the blindness. And that, as he told that diabetes is also a emerging disease, not only in the developed country and in developing country. I have seen the diabetes is increasing in Nepal and in Myanmar and other countries also as well. So effect of the diabetes in the eye is also a huge problem in the future. It will come. In developed country, it is already already exist, but in developing country, it is coming. One of the emerging eye care problem where the facilities are not very adequate. But still, cataract is the leading cause of the blindness. And it is ongoing process. We all know that it is the ongoing process. And usually, it is with the old people. When old age, they get other problem also. Not uh, besides eye disease, they have general health con condition is poor and they have other disease and they have blood pressure and diabetes. All those things are disturbing this. So I think that if we, we need to change our perspective to tackle the blindness in the developing country, because in our countries, the Government priority is not the eye care. Government priority is here malaria, HIV, cholera, and other disease. So many other life-threatening disease. So eye care is not very much uh, in priority. That's why the NGO sector are more aggressively working in our countries in the eye care. Like in Myanmar, monasteries are working in Myanmar. So several all several monks they establish some eye clinic in their village and they invite doctor from the city and do eye camp like that. I, I'd like to add, and I, I just like to add. I think one of the things we need to do is make it a priority of our governments. You know, we have you know, Dr. Mustafa is now in the health ministry in Sierra Leone. One of the big problems in Africa has been that all of the health ministries are so strapped for funds that and a lot of the foreign aid that they receive is tied to metrics of the UN Millennium Goals. And in order to get US aid, they need to meet certain standards of infant mortality and maternal mortality. And then all of a sudden, something like uh, Ebola comes and they go, oh my God, we've got to build these Ebola centers. And then COVID comes and, oh, we have to have all this testing programs and all these special COVID sites, and there's no money left in the health ministry. And the thing that gets pushed to the side because it's not seen as being immediately responsible for deaths is eye care. And we have to get it back into the forefront and have the local officials realize that when you go blind as a child, you have a congenital cataract that doesn't get operated on in Sierra Leone, even though these are you know malnourished children, they, they die at a rate way, way beyond their sighted peers. And the same thing, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the life expectancy is one third that of age and health matched peers once you go blind. So I think we really need to get it so it's pushed not just for NGOs, but so the government systems realize 
the importance and also the economic return. You know, when you restore sight to someone with cataract surgery, you're allowing that child to go to school and the lifetime earnings of their children are dramatically increased. But a lot of people return to work. And for your your audience here that's non-physicians, when we're doing cataract surgery in some of these poor countries, the average age is in the early 60s. And we have a lot of people who are going blind in their late 50s, early 60s, and they have many productive years left. And so that return to the economy is so dramatic. So the thing we need to do is figure out how to make it a priority. So it's not just NGOs and people providing free surgery, but ways of creating systems that are sustainable, that the best doctors in these poor countries want to go into ophthalmology. They make a good living and it becomes a priority for the government and not something that we're relying on NGO and charity yeah. for the long run. What do you think? So if I may add just one thing, uh, I'm assuming everyone who's in this room or listening is maybe thinking about going into global health. And uh, first of all, do go into global health. <laughs> but then when you do, um, you'll be running organizations, working with organizations who are hopefully helping um, developing countries like Sierra Leone. When you get to these countries, please get to the government or the Ministry of Health and ask them, what do you want us to help you with? What are your priorities and how do you think we can fit in with these priorities? I give you this example. We recently had a meeting with um, the donor and the agenda for the meeting is we want to meet with the Ministry of Health and hear your priorities and see how we can step in. We go to this meeting, I had a list of like 20 different things, right? So we go to this meeting, I spent 20 minutes going over everything we think um, as the ministry we decided it can help us with. And then they're like, thank you very much for this and spend like 10 seconds telling us, yeah, but none of these are what we're here for. We just want to do this. And then you're thinking, okay, so why are we in this meeting? You know, so um, that's, I think that's one of the biggest issues we have as developing countries. We do depend a lot on, uh, as Jeff said, on um, donor partners and NGOs to help in moving the health um, sector forward. But at the same time, it's, um, I think we can achieve a lot more if you don't just taste to us what you think we should be doing based on, you know, the criteria you want to fulfill with the uh, donors, but also what the ministry or the people on the ground think the priorities are for their own people's health. Mm -hmm. That's what I like. Yes, uh, thank you for adding that. I think that's been one of the things that has helped us work together is is uh, we, I think we see each other as equal partners or uh, now you outrank me, so <laughs> maybe not equal anymore. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it goes a long way when the partner asks you, what do you want to do and how do you think I can help? It gives you the confidence to tell them what you want. And also, you feel like you own the, the program or whatever it is you're doing, you own it, you're enthusiastic about it. You can sell it to your government and to your people because it came from you. So uh, one more question for each of the panelists, try to keep it sort of short. Um, what practical advice would you give to an early career person interested in, a, in global medicine? Dr. Pan? Sorry, can you please repeat the question? What practical advice would you give to, say, a, a student or a fellow or somebody early in their career who's interested in global medicine? Yeah, my yeah, I would like to advise that uh, yeah, global medical field is very big a field where you can do so many things in the different part of the world and you have to choose your practice what you want to, to do and what you want to do, achieve and where you want to do it so these are very important factor and the current situation is also political situation some countries has very bad political situation even if you have good idea and you can do it more but the 
political situation and your counterpart may get some difficulty. I have that experience in Myanmar. I got lots of difficulties there. It's not an easy country. I, yeah, in Uganda, I did not get any problem in Uganda and other country, but Myanmar, I got problem. That's why you have to be committed. Even you get the problem, you have to solve them and go ahead. If you get yeah. problem, if you return back, then you are returning back in same position. So you have to fight with the problem. And I think that sometimes problem can bring you the opportunities. Sure. Yeah, I you, can, you can make it strong yourself. So I will just want to suggest to the, our young colleague that first of all, you have to determine your mind and you have to choose your field and you have to choose your place where you want to work, then don't change it. Yeah. Take the problem and go ahead. What do you think, Dr. Tabin? I, I agree with uh, what Dr. Pond said, but I think also just, you know, you have to follow your passion. You know, I think you have to find something that really excites you. And there, there's so much. And then really kind of follow your passion and stay with one area and develop one area of expertise. There's so much in global medicine and it's so hard to keep from like jumping from one thing to the next. And as Dr. Pond so beautifully just put it, I think to really find what you're really passionate about and find an area of expertise and that will allow you to sort of especially in the early stages of your career, ascend to a level where you can then maybe branch out more broadly. But I would say start with a, there's so much, start with a narrow focus and uh, really focus on getting things done well. And then the other thing is that every person on this planet is just as important and to really focus on the quality. And one thing that I don't like in a lot of global public health um, are that people look at volume rather than quality and that we, we really need quality. And then the last thing is uh, Dr. Mustafa said, you need to think about what, you know, the perspective of the local person and what is really needed in Sierra Leone and listen to your partners, whether it's in Myanmar or Dr. Williams is working in possibly the hardest place to work on the planet right now. He's the principal person bringing eye care to South Sudan, which is probably ground zero for the most blindness per capita in the world and the most challenging government and political situation to work with and lack of resources. But to do that, it's really a matter of listening to the needs of the local people. Do you have one quick thing you want to say about that? Yeah, um, I think first advice is find your partner like Lloyd. <laughs> <laughs> but um, on the most serious note, um, I, I would like to reiterate what the others have said. Having passion for wherever you want to go into is very important because nothing is easy. Um, lots of the places where global health is very much needed, these are difficult places to work with, to become very you don't have maybe the comforts that you're used to, like electricity or internet, things you take for granted, yeah? they are not there. So it's very easy to quit if you're not really passionate about why you are there and what you're doing. So make sure you have that. And also find a few like-minded people, if possible, wherever you're going, whether they're your colleagues or, or the people you're partnering with, because they make it just a little bit easier to work together in places. Because um, when I'm working with my we can work anywhere yeah. and it gets to where we want to go. And we are going to work anywhere. We're going to uh, El Salvador actually in two days together to do cornea transplants there. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really exciting that uh, we've worked in Sierra Leone together, but now we're branching out into another country to work together as, as partners in bringing cornea transplant to El Salvador. Um, yeah, on that note, be flexible. Yeah. <laughs> so my, my family, I was coming to the US to give a talk at Duke, and in two days, I'm going to El Salvador. <laughs>
Um, so I'll close with one little thing. We just have about 30 seconds left. You know, we've talked a lot about the impacts on families and stuff. I think you could make a serious case that there would be no intervention you could make for the dollar that would send more girls in Africa to school than doing cataract surgery. At about $25 a surgery, each person that you do surgery on, like Jeff showed with the with the patient, with the kid leading the adult with the stick, um, we saw kids all over South Sudan that would just curl up on the grandparents' feet or their parents' feet, like almost like you would watch a dog curl up at your feet. And these are children who have no life. You take the bandages off and you see the light, new life in the adult, but you see the new life in the kid. The kid it occurs to them right away, wait a sec, I have a future now. And for an intervention of $20 to restore sight to a person and put a kid in school, yeah, I don't think you could beat that with anything. So that's why we're so passionate about what we do. I want to thank all of the people who, who spoke, Jeff and Bidia. Thank you so much. This work you've done is amazing. Thank you, Dr. Mustafa. It's just really incredible to be in the presence of three people who've done so much for, for alleviating human suffering around the world. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Hey, Bidia, I'm going to give you a call in about 10 minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and Lloyd, I'll I'll call you on FaceTime in a, in a couple of minutes as well. Thank you, everybody, and good luck, everybody. And my my email, well, my just share my email very quickly. It's Taben at Stanford.edu. If anyone in the audience wants to uh, reach out to me, it's Taben at Stanford.edu. Okay,